Hey everyone, welcome back to another edition of Inside the FLX here on FingerLakes1.com and FL1 Radio. We are closing in on Election Day, and this will be another installment of our election preview series as we look at New York State Senate District 58. My guest this hour is Senator Tom O'Mara, who discussed everything from the state of politics to protecting local lakes and water supplies. First, though, a brief message from today's show sponsor, and of course, a reminder to our viewers and listeners at home that Inside the FLX is available as a podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and the FingerLakes1.com app. Get that today for Android and iOS free of charge. Inside the FLX and other programming on FingerLakes1.com is made possible by local sponsors supporting local reporting. Learn more about advertising on FingerLakes1 by clicking on the Advertise button at the bottom of our homepage. I was severely injured. I was on a ventilator. My husband was scared and he just went for the nearest number that he had heard advertised over and over and figured they're the best, they know what they're doing. I think that's the typical reaction, but unfortunately it wasn't the right one. And I'm thankful that we learned that early on in the process. He decided to look for someone locally who would give us a little more personalized attention. And when we met Steve and talked with him, we knew that we had found that person. If you you want to feel like you have an attorney who's in your corner, who's going to listen to you, who's going to endeavor to understand you, give Steve a call. I really felt like everyone at Madej, Miris & Ricky really cared. For a law firm that cares about you, contact Madej, Miris & Ricky at 315-568-0911. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. So, Senator, thanks for being here. Uh, obviously, a, a lot to get to, a lot to talk about. Um, what are, what are sort of the, the top issues of your platform as you go talk to folks, hear what different people have to say, different perspectives? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity uh, to be here with you. Uh, you know, running for re-election in the 58th Senate District uh, is uh, a lot of work, uh, a lot of ground to cover, five counties uh, to cover, uh, spanning from Hornell to uh, Ithaca. So it's just really the southern half of the Finger Lakes, across the southern tier. Uh, and the main issues uh, throughout the region uh, continue to be uh, the economy, uh, jobs, jobs, and jobs. Uh, is the most important uh, aspect uh, of this and where I spend most of my efforts working uh, in the legislature. Uh, also, the environment uh, ranks right up there. Uh, and as chair of the Environmental Conservation Committee in the Senate, um, working very hard on environmental issues, particularly uh, water quality, uh, which we're so concerned about here uh, everywhere as we should be, uh, but particularly here in the Finger Lakes uh, and the, uh, the issues with harmful algal blooms. Uh, and we're doing a lot uh, at the state uh, to uh, get at this, uh, the HABs issue uh, and water quality in general. Uh, so those are the main issues. Uh, you know, the economy, uh, we uh, have always in the southern tier kind of lagged going into a recession uh, and then lagged coming out of the recession. This time we're really lagging coming out of the recession. Uh, there are some bright spots uh, in uh, the region. You know, Ithaca has probably the, the best going economy uh, uh, in the region. Uh, very low unemployment, uh, you know, but they have significant poverty issues there as we do across the 58th Senate District. Uh, areas on the Finger Lakes like uh, Watkins Glen, uh, Geneva uh, are doing quite well. Penny Ann just won the uh, uh, the third round of the Downtown Revitalization Initiative. Yeah. They've got a lot of good things going on, but areas like Elmira uh, and Bath uh, continue to struggle uh, very much. So uh, I, I work very hard on manufacturing issues uh, in, in the focus of a lot of what I do. And a few years ago, we were able to uh, eliminate the corporate franchise tax on manufacturers, but it only applied to uh, uh, Subchapter C corporations, which are the larger ones, mm -hmm. uh, and we're working on an effort right now. We started it a couple years ago, had it proposed in the budget last year, didn't make it in, to include those smaller manufacturing entities, the Subchapter S corporations, the partnerships, the LLCs, the sole proprietorships. Mm -hmm. Those are taxed on the individual's income tax return. That's why they were treated different than Subchapter sub C corporations. So we have an effort to eliminate uh, those, uh, those corporate taxes on those types of entities because I firmly believe that manufacturing needs to be the focus and the base of our economy. 
uh, manufacturing across the southern tier in Finger Lakes, uh, uh, and in this country for that matter, is not what it was 30 and 40 years ago. But we still have a strong manufacturing base uh, in the southern tier. Uh, and uh, with agribusinesses, uh, with advanced manufacturing, uh, with many manufacturers, we still have in the southern tier region the highest uh, percentage of manufacturing jobs of any of the 10 regional economic uh, regions that we have. Uh, so we still have a decent base in manufacturing. And, and uh, one of the problems we're having there, most of all, is workforce development. Uh, we have manufacturers that they are looking to expand. Uh, we have uh, an aging uh, uh, workforce, uh, and these manufacturers are having trouble finding uh, younger people to work uh, with the skills needed to work in these in these more and more high tech industries. And workforce development uh, is right up there as uh, one of the top three priorities uh, that uh, I'm certainly focusing on. So speak to that a little bit. How how difficult is it? And, and I guess there there might be an element of feeling a little. Like there's a lack of control. Uh, the state is losing young people in droves. Um, obviously, some attempts have been made on the education front in Albany to fix that or to try and fix it. Um, have those efforts been successful? And what do you, what else can be done? I guess to keep those young people here. Yeah, with the uh, with the STEM efforts, uh, and now and now we're calling it STEAM because we throw the arts in there uh, as well. Corning Community College has a big effort going on right now in the, in the STEAM front. Uh, I think our education system uh, was slow to respond uh, to this. Uh, they are responding now, and I'm talking both uh, our K through 12 system uh, as well as our community colleges. Uh, I think our education system, frankly, uh, has failed a generation uh, of youth by its focus on everybody must go to college. Uh, and, and if you don't go to college, you're not going to make it. That's just not the case. You know, our BOCES programs got away from uh, more vocational and skilled type uh, programming. They're starting to get back at that right now. I've been working uh, with our BOCES leaders and with our K-12 uh, uh, educators and the community colleges to work at efforts to get students engaged because we've seen, at least I've seen, um, that not all students are going to go to college. Not all have the capacity, uh, and, and, and kids learn in different ways. Uh, some learn a lot better with, with hands-on experience uh, and, and working with their hands, uh, w whether it's high-tech or, or whether it's uh, more traditional manufacturing. Uh, we have uh, um, seen improvements uh, in getting that focused uh, right now. Right now there's an I-86 coalition uh, along uh, Interstate 86 to work on workforce development. Um, many initiatives going on there, and, and we are starting to see some progress there. But uh, with the aging workforce, jobs opening up, and manufacturers wanting to expand, uh, they're having a difficult time finding the right skilled workforce. Is, is that, say, we'll call it the, the 45 to 60 uh, age range of the workforce a particular concern? Uh, yeah, and I, and I think, you know, even older than that, we've got a workforce uh, well over 60 uh, that is working. And, and we've seen in a lot of these uh, more traditional manufacturers the, uh, that we've got, such as Corning Incorporated, even though they're very high tech and a leader in the world on research and development, they're still doing a lot of manufacturing. But you've got in Corning, you've got uh, uh, what was called World Kitchen, which is now Corel. They make the old Corningware uh, stuff. They're expanding. Uh, you have strong companies like uh, Hilliard uh, and Howell and Elmira uh, that are that are doing manufacturing. Kennedy Valve in Elmira. Uh, you have Alstom Manufacturing in Hornell, which is doing uh, rail car development. You know we have a great uh, rail car um, kind of corridor here in the southern tier between Elmira, Bath, and and Hornell with three major manufacturers of rail cars. With the shape that uh, uh, the MTA in New York City is, and all the work that they need, you know, we've got a, a bright future in being able to provide uh, those needs uh, with manufacturing rail cars. Uh, uh, and those uh, are both high tech. You know, Alstom and Hornell is designing the first high speed rail, uh, the Acela, uh, for Amtrak that's going to be in the United States. So it'll be the first one uh, of its kind in the United States. They're actually designing it, engineering it, and they're going to build it in Hornell. So let's talk a little bit about that because you talk about jobs and then you talk about small businesses, large businesses, and they all need infrastructure. Uh, there, there is a lot of focus in the southern tier, so it seems from the outside on 
increasing broadband access, which is awesome. Um, but are the sort of traditional, obviously we hear about bridges and roads, it seems like every year, um, they need work, they need money, they need all of these things. Uh, is, is that being forgotten in Albany or do you think that's something that is still a priority? No, that's still a priority. Um, our, our roads and bridges, uh, sewer, water infrastructure, you know, nobody's uh, fought harder uh, for our for our highway and, and road and bridge uh, infrastructure than myself uh, and our assemblyman here, Phil Pomisano. He's a good friend of mine and colleague. Uh, we have worked for years on, on increasing the CHIPS funding, which is the local uh, money that comes from the state to local governments. Uh, it's a very, f it's one of the more fair programs in the state because it's based on actual road mileage. Right. No politics involved. However many miles you get of road you have to maintain, uh, you get a you get a percentage of the pot. We have uh, Phil and I have uh, been able to increase that chips funding over the past six years by 45 to 55 percent in most municipalities, um, and that's been a huge upswing. While the governor uh, has blocked. Uh, increases to AIM, which is aid and incentives to municipalities, standard government uh, assistance for local governments. That's been flat since Cuomo's been in office. He hasn't allowed that to grow. But we've been able to help offset that stagnation with CHIPS increases. And that's, that goes directly to every road project in your town, your village, your city. Uh, and it helps offset what would be increases to the tax base by providing uh, uh, those resources. And, you know, since uh, um, uh, my colleague in the Senate, Senator Pam Helming, uh, has been in office for a short time, she's jumped on this bandwagon with Phil Pomisano and I in helping to increase the, uh, uh, the CHIPS funding. Our local governments uh, are extremely happy uh, with the work that we've done uh, to improve that because our roads and bridges are, are critical. Broadband is, is hugely important. Um, and, and we did a, a $500 million initiative just a couple years ago that is still in the process of being doled out uh, for projects. We're not making the progress as fast as we would like to see. And one of the problems of that $500 million build out is that when um, w a lot of the territory in the state is covered by uh, what was Time Warner and Charter, which is now Spectrum Communications, uh, the big, bad, evil, huge corporation that, that everybody hates, but, you know, everybody hates uh, uh, NYSEG and Niagara Mohawk and Rochester Gas and Electric uh, and your cable bill because, you know, you, you pay them 100 to $200 a month and nobody likes to do that, so we complain a lot. But what the governor did when he allowed the merger of Time Warner uh, and Charter into Spectrum he said, okay, you're going to be required to build out all your territory. You're not going to have access to any of this $500 million we're going to use in the other parts of the state. Um, now, Spectrum has done a, a, a decent amount of build out. They're, they're not where they should be. They're not where I would like them to be, uh, but they are making uh, efforts to do that. Uh, and, you know, the governor has come out, as we've seen, in a tax spectrum. Uh, threatened to, to take their franchise away from the in the state. That's never going to happen. Right. They're the largest provider in the state. Yeah. Uh, that all boils down to two years ago, Governor Cuomo made a promise that we would have 100% broadband build out by the end of 2018. We're still not close to that. Yeah. So what's the governor need? A scapegoat. So you take on the, the, the big bad spectrum that everybody hates because they pay him $200 a month, and it's an easy target. Uh, it's not fair. It's not a fair way of dealing with an industry uh, in this state. And we've seen that over and over again with our attorney general in the state attacking specific industries, um, squeezing fines and uh, civil judgments out of them, which has really funded the governor's economic development programs uh, over the years. Uh, and it, it sends a bad message to any industry. Why would you want to do business in New York if, if you're going to get squeezed every few years? Uh, to get to to wrangle more dollars out of you, so the governor governor can spend it on his economic development programs. Uh, a lot of that money that was that came, um, uh, you know, has gone into economic development. I think some more of that should have gone into uh, actual debt reduction uh, and more into infrastructure than we have. Uh, but uh, on infrastructure as well, two years ago, uh, you know, being the chair again of the Environmental Conservation Committee. We passed a $2.6 billion bond act for water quality infrastructure, which is going directly to municipalities to, to upgrade, uh, fix their water and sewer systems. Uh, and that's going to help a lot with our environmental issues uh, overall, uh, as well as help these municipalities keep that basic infrastructure up that we need 
uh, for, for people uh, to live, uh, but for industry to be able to grow. So you, you, were, you mentioned the, the CHIPS funding and the, the sort of the fairer programs. Um, is there a greater need for those style programs in New York State? So the funding does uh, feel a little less sort of picked and chosen rather than just going to who actually needs it? Um, yes, uh, there's been a lot of politics involved in our economic development programs. Uh, and, I, and I've been a supporter of our economic development programs because our state business environment is so uncompetitive with neighboring states and other states that we're competing against in the country. And every state is providing incentives um, to lure businesses to grow or to come and locate there. So we need some of that. But we should be focusing also on level the playing field for all businesses so that they can afford to be here. These, these companies that have been here 100, 150 years uh, that are doing business and, and maintaining under the burdensome um, taxation, cost of doing business, over-regulation uh, in this state. Uh, I'm working on about the fairness of these systems and not the so-called political cherry-picking of uh, favorites. Um, similar to CHIPS, we're looking at starting a program uh, that would do a similar thing with, with water and sewer infrastructure that would be based, again, kind of like on road miles, based on how long your system is. You would get uh, an equitable share of funding to be able to maintain and expand these systems, because the more we can expand sewer uh, and water systems, the, the more we protect our environment and, and the more accessible uh, uh, these services are when an industry is looking to locate or expand. Is that the way economic development should also sort of start to trend? We see the, the sort of, the, obviously with the DRI, you see the, the larger communities or the more organized communities uh, putting themselves out there for that. But there are a whole lot of other communities, especially in the southern tier, smaller ones, um, that could use a lot of that money and, and it would help them a great deal. Is that sort of a, a sort of direction that that also needs to go eventually? Well, I think so, and I and I think we're we're seeing that. Certainly, we've had great success in the Finger Lakes with the with the communities that have won uh, those DRIs with with uh, Watkins Glen, Geneva, Penyan, as I mentioned, uh, the city of Elmira uh, got one, uh, and Elmira desperately needed it and is, and is taking full advantage of it. Certainly a, a $10 million stimulus like that goes much further in a smaller community like Watkins Glen or Penyan than it does in, in Elmira or, or even a larger community of uh, Geneva. But uh, it's important uh, that we provide those, uh, uh, those funds to be able to help these communities because every smaller uh, upstate city uh, is struggling. They're all suffer suffering from the same malaise of, uh, of what happened to really these downtown populations starting back in the 70s uh, that, that took a lot of the commerce out of the cities, uh, moved it into retail and malls uh, out of the city uh, bases. We saw that uh, in Elmira. We, we've certainly seen it in Geneva. Um, and, you know, it's a way to revitalize these communities, to get some activities and, and look at the, what I think the younger, uh, uh, the younger uh, individuals in the workforce, entering the workforce from college or, or right out of high school, you know, they want that kind of a, a downtown vibrancy. And, and I think restoring a lot of these second floor spaces that have been unused in these communities for a long time to create that housing uh, that's needed. Uh, that, that's decent housing and it's and it's close to, you know, maybe, maybe a few restaurants, a few bars, a uh, little shopping outlets, uh, uh, to be able to have that kind of nexus uh, so people can have that community. And, and I think the younger generation is more interested in, in being able to, to walk around in a community like that rather than, you know, having to drive out to the mall or right. drive uh, to a restaurant. So obviously, uh, a lot of what you're talking about is trying to, to level the playing field, reallocate things, so everything happening in New York State is happening on more of an even basis. Uh, that said, a lot of folks also believe that Albany needs to cut the spending. They need to slow down, pump the brakes, uh, if you will. Uh, what do you say to those folks who, obviously, you are fighting, I'm sure, for that very cause, mm -hmm. uh, but what do you say to them when, year after year, it kind of seems like we're still going the other direction? Uh, it does. Well, the, the problem uh, in New York, we, we don't have a revenue problem in New York. You know, we've got close to $160 billion budget going on right now. The revenues are not the problem. And as the economy improves, and as it has improved certainly more downstate 
uh, than upstate in this in this uh, post recessionary period. We're still in upstate. Um, revenues increase without increasing taxes. It's just more activity, uh, and there's more tax revenues generated. We need to focus on controlling that spending uh, so that we can across the board, make New York a more competitive business environment. Make it more affordable for people to live here. Property taxes is a huge concern. Um, you know, unfunded mandates from Albany, um, while times are good and the state can absorb some of these increases uh, because revenues are increasing and, and the financial industry in Wall Street drives the budget in New York State, uh, we have a flow of, of roughly $6 billion annually uh, that flows from downstate to upstate. Uh, um, you know, even though there's a lot of people that want to divide upstate and downstate, uh, there would be a huge, long sucking sound if we lost that six billion dollar net flow of revenues from really the financial industry uh, that spreads across upstate New York. So, uh, while times are good, we should be looking at reducing things like property taxes, unfunded mandates, Medicaid being the biggest one. I've sponsored legislation for several years now to have the state take over the full local share of Medicaid. Uh, some most of our counties are in the 40 to 60 percent range of their entire property tax levy goes to pay for Medicaid which is a state mandated program uh, if the state were to take that over it's about an eight billion dollar share so I don't think the state's in a position to do that over one year but I think we could do it over six to eight years and build it into growth and and take that burden off and, and at the same time require counties to lower their tax levies while that money uh, is being taken back over by the state. Uh, it, it's the right thing to do. Uh, we should be looking to do that with other mandates as well. So how, how the, the obviously steady stream of uh, corruption uh, news coming out of Albany, it seems, every day or every week, uh, are things getting better? I guess that's, that's probably the blunt question that a lot of folks are wondering. Uh, are uh, I, things getting I th better? I think things are getting better uh, in this sense, and that is that we are seeing investigations and prosecutions. You know, eight years ago, ten years ago, the, there was no f real focus, it seemed, on uh, public corruption uh, statewide. Uh, it's been a real problem, uh, and you know, everybody wants to increase uh, the laws, make new criminal laws, more ways to go after corrupt, uh, uh, corrupt public officials. Um, but every public official that's been investigated, uh, indicted, charged, uh, found guilty, have, 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 it's been done with the existing laws we have. I think the bribery statutes we have, the criminal laws we have, uh, are adequate, frankly. We have done more uh, as far as financial disclosure requirements for elected officials in Albany over the recent years. Uh, than any other state. We have, we have very detailed disclosure of, of personal finances of elected officials such as myself. Um, and, you know, I think that the focus on investigation and enforcement uh, from law enforcement has been very good. I think we should continue to encourage that. Uh, I think the Moreland Commission that uh, Governor Cuomo started uh, and then, and then fold it up uh, as soon as it started sniffing around uh, uh, his uh, dealings. Uh, you know, most of the corruption that we've seen, the high-profile stuff, uh, at least as regarding the governor, has been related to his economic development programs and the efforts to to win that kind of grant funding from the state. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, last topic here before we get you on your way, uh, health care. Is there an affordable solution to health care? Uh, obviously, the, the state seems to be, or the governor's administration seems to be pushing uh, very hard toward uh, at least supplementing whatever the federal government does to roll back the Affordable Care Act, um, or at least he seems committed to that. What does what does New York State have to do over the next two years, two, three years, to fix it? Well, I, I think um, uh, that we have a strong focus in New York on providing uh, health benefits for those that need it and deserve it. And everybody should have access to health care. Um, we have been doing uh, our best to supplement, at least, at least to plan for, if these cuts come from the federal government. Uh, and they really haven't yet. There's been a lot of threats and talk of that. Yeah scaremongering on both sides, uh, I think. Um, we need to work on the way uh, to, to fill the gap. Those that are on Medicaid, uh, 
and, and get that uh, quality health care through there. Uh, and then those that don't have health care, uh, that in-between gap is where we need to focus and provide better programs. Uh, and we need to do it in a way that, you know, we talk about what the so-called fiscal cliff, which is somebody that's on public services, social services, Medicaid, uh, welfare, uh, uh, food supplements, whatever, that that they need a gradual, uh, a gradual down um, slide of those benefits when they're in a position of improving themselves personally, getting a better job. Uh, when you see and hear a lot of stories of somebody has a job but they can't take a better one because if they do, they're going to lose these benefits they get, and it, it doesn't make sense for them to do that. We, we shouldn't have that problem. If you're going to improve yourself and be able to get a better job, you shouldn't just hit that cliff and lose all your benefits. There should be a, a gradual trend down uh, as you improve yourself so you don't have that concern of, of doing better and, and, you know, have it negatively affecting uh, your life or your children or your family uh, because you lose those benefits, whether it's housing assistance, food stamps, uh, welfare, Medicaid. Uh, these are very important uh, issues, and, and we need to find a way to, to, to help with that, and that will help that middle area of, of uninsured uh, people out there right now. And there's a lot of talk about the uh, uh, single-payer health care uh, uh, in, this, uh, in uh, this state. I think it would be a disaster for New York State to do it on its own. It would cost uh, uh, 130 to $180 billion a year. Our total tax revenues in the state are 75 or $80 billion. Mm -hmm. That's going to more than double the taxes we have right now, uh, and, and uh, first of all, we can't do it because the federal government wouldn't allow us to use the, the Medicare funding and Medicaid funding in that way. The federal government uh, uh, can't terminate um, individual private insurance policies, which everybody would have to give up that has insurance through their employer or, or any way right now. You would lose that insurance and be forced into this government-run insurance program uh, which would be disastrous. Uh, you know, I've talked a lot today about competitiveness between uh, uh, other states. Um, that's going to make us even less competitive and harder uh, to influence uh, or get our business economy going here in New York. So uh, obviously, trending, uh, jumping right off of that, the opioid epidemic, uh, something that a lot of people are talking about. Is, is there? Some people feel like we are making progress, but in small communities, rural parts of the region, Southern Tier and the Finger Lakes. Uh, it doesn't feel that way. Yeah. Uh, what are you What are you saying, or what is being proposed? Uh, we have increased funding substantially. I've been on the Senate task force uh, for heroin and, and opioid addiction uh, for several years now. Um, Senator Pam Helming, my colleague in this area with us, is involved in that as well. This is a huge problem, and it, and it's not really opioid is the biggest problem because that was what causing immediate death for so many people. But we still have a methamphetamine, a bath salts issue, and some of our rural communities, it kind of goes around that circle of what's available at the, at the moment is, is what the drug users are using. Um, we have increased funding substantially in the state for providing services. Uh, most of that money has been spent in the larger urban areas. We still have too far to go from our rural areas to get to a real treatment or detoxification center. Uh, we need to we need to get more beds available. Uh, you know, we did have uh, 30 some beds uh, created in Tompkins County uh, just a year or two ago for this purpose. Um, that's really a drop in the bucket for what we need. Uh, and if you've got to drive, you know, more than half an hour to get drug rehab, it's just not going to happen. Right. Uh, the reality is, it's not going to happen. The governor. Uh, with regards to mental health and, and drug addiction kind of go hand in hand and they're similar issues. You know, the governor has, has cut psychiatric beds, treatment beds in this state significantly. I fought years ago to save the Elmira Psychiatric Center, which is still open and doing well. Uh, but the governor is trying to force these services from state facilities, whether it's, whether it's mental health, whether it's individuals with developmental disabilities, uh, whether it's drug treatment. Uh, into the uh, not-for-profit community, which is great, and we've got great not-for-profits in our communities. They're just not geared up enough yet uh, to handle that. Uh, and while there's an effort ongoing to help with that, it's going to take a lot more than what we're doing right now uh, to beef up uh, our community organizations, not-for-profit services, 
Uh, but we're still going to have that need for, for strong state-run facilities uh, to handle the, the, hardest, uh, the hardest cases to deal with. All right. Well, uh, really appreciate the time. Obviously, a busy time for you. Uh, best of luck on Election Day, and uh, we'll be talking to you. Well, thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely.